Evacuating from an aircraft can be a frightening experience, and even a dangerous one, especially if the aircraft catches on fire. But sometimes things go well, and everybody gets out okay. Hello, and welcome to the conversation at airsafe.com. I'm your host, Dr. Todd Curtis, the director of the airsafe.com foundation, and the creator of airsafe.com, your reliable source of airline safety and security information since 1996. This conversation will focus on evacuation issues, specifically lessons learned from the crash of an Air France A340 in Toronto, Canada in August of 2005. Following the overview of this accident, there will be a discussion of evacuation issues, a review of past research on evacuation, and specific passenger recommendations for every flight and especially for flights where there may be an emergency landing and an emergency evacuation. Let's start with an overview of this accident. On August 2, 2005, an Air France A340 was on a flight from Paris to Toronto. For a variety of reasons, partly due to the environmental conditions and partly due to crew actions, the aircraft ran off the runway, crossed a road, stopped in a ravine where it caught fire. Many of the exits were damaged or unusable, but in spite of that, all of the occupants of the aircraft were able to escape and no one was killed. Because the accident occurred in Canada, the investigation was conducted by the Transportation Safety Board of Canada. In addition to a very extensive written report, there are also a couple of video simulations of the final stages of the flight. Because all of the data in the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder were usable, there was quite a bit of information about the characteristics of this flight and about the situation this aircraft was in. The key circumstances of this accident were rapidly changing weather with a condition of severe thunderstorms, heavy rain, and lightning, as well as significant tailwinds, which led in part to the aircraft not being able to stop on the runway. Also, beyond the end of the runway, there was sloping terrain and obstructions, which led to severe aircraft damage, including damage that led to a post-crash fire. Although airport fire crews arrived on the scene quickly, most of the passenger cabin and other parts of the aircraft were destroyed by the fire. Although the cockpit voice recorder and flight data recorder were damaged in the accident, the data was intact. The quality of the data allowed the investigating authorities to have a very complete picture of what went on. From the data, it was clear that several miles from the runway, the aircraft was on autopilot in a stabilized landing configuration and flying along the glide slope. However, about 35 seconds before landing, the crew, sensing there might be a wind shear condition, decided to disconnect the autopilot and fly manually. One of the things they did was increase the thrust on the engines. As a result of the increased thrust, the aircraft sped up and started to fly above the glide slope. Around this time the wind shifted direction. While there was still a crosswind condition, there was also a tailwind condition. These three factors, increased speed, flying above the glide slope, and having a tailwind condition, were major contributors to what happened next. Rather than landing at the normal touchdown point of about a thousand feet beyond the threshold of the 9,000 foot runway, the aircraft actually touched down about 3,800 feet down the runway. Although the brakes and thrust reversers were fully engaged, the aircraft ended up running off the end of the runway at about 86 knots, or 99 miles an hour, and came to rest in a ravine several seconds later after running over a road through a guardrail and other obstructions. Things began happening rather quickly after this. Because of damage sustained by the aircraft, it caught fire. Also, there was damage to the electrical system, so the cabin crew was unable to communicate to the passengers effectively. Although fire crews were there very quickly after the aircraft came to a stop, the fire eventually destroyed the entire cabin and other parts of the aircraft as well. Fortunately, all the passengers were able to get out. The investigating authorities concluded that crew actions due to wind shear concerns affected the landing, but the aircraft touched down long due to its speed and to reduce visibility, which made it hard for the crew to figure out exactly where they were relative to the runway. Water on the runway and the tailwind situation put the aircraft over the landing limits with respect to being able to stop fully on the runway. The tailwind condition left the crew no margin for error when it came to the landing distance available to the aircraft. Also, it was found that the use of brakes and thrust reversers were delayed, and the crew's flight plan did not include computing landing distances for the circumstances they encountered. It was clear there was a thunderstorm present at Toronto during the landing. In fact, there were multiple lightning strikes happening all around the aircraft as it landed. The investigating authorities didn't fault the crew for deciding to land during a thunderstorm, since landing in these conditions is standard industry practice. 
Also, there is no indication that the aircraft was affected by wind shear or struck by lightning during the landing. The major findings was that there was a combination of factors involved. Visibility, crew planning, crew decisions, and weather were all major factors. Passenger actions delayed evacuation, but apparently these actions did not contribute to the injuries that occurred during the evacuation. I'd like to go back a bit and explain a concept mentioned earlier. Wind shear is defined as a sudden and dramatic change in wind speed or direction over a small area. Because of the danger this poses to the aircraft, there are specific procedures pilots take when encountering wind shear conditions. And once again, during the investigation, the authorities did not see any evidence that there was in fact a wind shear condition during this landing. When we come back, we'll talk about the evacuation aspects of this crash, as well as insights about evacuations gained over the years through research and observation. Analyzing accidents is one of the most important ways that the aviation industry reduces the risk of flying. If you're an aviation safety professional, or someone who's interested in the study of aviation safety and aviation accidents, one of the things you have to do is be able to systematically ask and answer questions involving aviation safety data. Fortunately, there's a book out there that can show you exactly how this can be done. The book, Understanding Aviation Safety Data, was written by me, Dr. Todd Curtis, and it's a detailed guide for asking and answering aviation safety and security questions. Based on years of research and the analysis of thousands of accidents and incidents, this book addresses the 12 basic types of aviation safety and security questions, with specific examples taken from sources such as online databases and from accident reports. The book is available from Speedbreak Publishing, you can find out more details at orders.speedbreak.com. And now let's get back to the analysis of this Air France accident. This was a very dramatic crash, with the aircraft being destroyed by fire. Even though everyone was able to escape this burning aircraft and no one was killed, there are still many issues that came about because of this event. For example, one of the things pointed out by the investigating authorities is that prior to the aircraft running off the runway, where it may have been quite clear to the cabin crew or the flight crew that the aircraft was about to go into a serious emergency situation, there was actually no order given for the passengers to take crash positions. Also because of damage that occurred after the aircraft ran off the runway, the cabin crew and the flight crew were unable to use communication systems within the aircraft to help direct the evacuation. However, in spite of that limitation, cabin crew and cockpit crew actions directly contributed to all the occupants getting out and getting out alive. Some passenger actions didn't help the situation. For example, over half the passengers stopped to take one or more items of cabin baggage before leaving the aircraft. One of the things that passengers should not do when there's an emergency evacuation is stop to take anything other than themselves out of the aircraft. Everyone was able to evacuate safely from the aircraft, which is all the more remarkable when you consider some of the other situations that were going on at the same time. For example, the A340 is typical of large jet transports in that it has multiple doors that can be used for emergency evacuations. This aircraft was equipped with eight doors. During certification, it's certified to evacuate a full load of passengers within roughly 90 seconds using only half of these doors. Due to damage to the aircraft and the fire that happened after the aircraft came to a stop, not all of these doors were fully used. In fact, two of the eight were not opened at all, and of the six remaining exit doors that were open, only five had slides deployed from them, and two of those slides deflated. In fact, two-thirds of the passengers evacuated through a single door. The authorities estimated that everyone was able to evacuate the aircraft in under two minutes. The last two people out of the aircraft were a flight crew member and a cabin crew member who went throughout the entire aircraft, making sure no passengers were left behind. Emergency evacuations are not a rare occurrence. In 2000, the National Transportation Safety Board of the United States released a study where they looked at 46 evacuations that occurred over a 21-month period. This averaged about one every 11 days, or about three per million flights. This study also revealed that exiting with baggage was an issue. That is, in spite of the warnings that are given, in spite of the pre-flight briefings that passengers usually get that say not to do this sort of thing, it still happens. The most dramatic and the most serious event associated with these 46 evacuations was a crash of an MD-80 aircraft in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1999. This aircraft also had eight exits. Three of them were not usable. However, because of the serious damage to the aircraft, passengers were able to use several fuselage brakes in order to escape the aircraft. In that event, 10 of the 139 passengers were killed. 
Serious accidents such as what happened in Little Rock and Toronto also bring up the issue of survivability of accidents. In another study by the NTSB from 2001, it was found that most accidents are in fact survivable. Their study looked at the period from 1983 to 2000 where there were 26 serious accidents involving U.S. airliners. Of those 26, 19 of them were survivable, meaning one or more passengers and crew were able to survive the event. Oftentimes it was due to them being able to escape the aircraft after the accident occurred. Like the case with evacuation research, survivability research involves many organizations around the world. Many of the kinds of insights that come about through analysis of accidents and of the survivability of accidents are the kind of things you see incorporated in pre-flight briefings. For example, when you fly, the cabin crew might make mention of the fact that you should note where you're sitting, count the number of rows to the exits that are in front of you, count the number of rows to the exits in back of you. Also, if you take the time to pull out the safety card, you'll see this kind of information. Things like the layout of the aircraft, the number of exits, the kinds of crash positions you should take in an emergency, that sort of thing. Speaking of crash positions, if you go to podcast.airsafe.org, where there's a list of all the previous podcasts, you'll see that one of them covered the six basic crash positions you can take. The six positions discussed in that podcast depend on the kind of seat you're in. For example, one position for the kind of seating you'd see in coach where you don't really have room to bend over and put your head between your legs, as well as the position you should take if you're in a seat that's in front of a bulkhead, or in a seat that happens to have shoulder harnesses and lap belts. That last seat is the kind of seat typically seen by a crew member, not by a passenger. The kind of common sense insights that have been gained through the analysis of aviation accidents are applicable in other areas as well. For example, in the book Parenting in the Internet, also written by myself, Dr. Todd Curtis, it's a practical how-to guide for parents of online children, which lays out in great detail the kinds of common hazards one faces when it comes to online privacy, online security, and other issues that are of concern to parents and children alike. The book has hundreds of free resources, including free software and free information resources, including, I might add, several resources that deal with aviation safety and security. Visit the publisher at orders.speedbreak.com, and you too can get your hands on a copy. Well, it looks like that's all the time we have for today. Before we end this conversation, I'd like to remind all my listeners that this podcast is produced by the Airsafe.com Foundation. This nonprofit organization is responsible for this podcast and for a variety of other efforts to further the public's understanding of aviation safety and aviation security. For information about the Foundation, or to make a tax-deductible donation, please visit the Foundation at airsafe.org. For more information about airline safety, you can find us at airsafe.com. That's A-I-R-S-A-F-E dot com or type the words airline safety into your favorite search engine. We're probably on the first page of results. Feel free to write to me at my email address, tcurtis at airsafe.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.